we are not ready for the data transmissions that AI needs. So it would be wrong to say AI is the problem. We need AI and we're using it, but we need to look at the data centers and make sure that they are more sustainable and that will help enormously to make AI bigger and better usable. Hello and welcome to Environment Variables, brought to you by the Green Software Foundation. In each episode, we discuss the latest news and events surrounding green software. On our show, you can expect candid conversations with top experts in their field who have a passion for how to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of software. I'm your host, Chris Adams. Welcome to Environment Variables, where we bring you the latest news and updates from the world of sustainable software development. I'm your host, Chris Skipper. Today, we're talking about a hot topic, the insatiable energy demands of AI. As AI operations continue to ramp up worldwide, they're consuming vast amounts of power and putting the climate targets of the tech industry in jeopardy. With no signs of slowing down, we could be heading towards an energy crisis unless AI is managed more effectively. In this climate, the need for green software practices has never been more critical. In our episode today, we'll unpack some startling data about how AI has drastically increased Google's carbon footprint. But it's not all bad news. We'll also investigate some encouraging solutions to this AI energy crisis. We'll look at how AWS data centers are being leveraged to reduce the carbon footprint of AI workloads, plus some strategies other data centers must adopt to ensure sustainability. Finally, we'll look at the exciting possibility of quantum computing to transform AI's energy costs and its broader implications for the green software movement. With us today, we have Marjolaine Pordon and Andrew Johnston. Let me start by introducing Marjolaine. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself, please? Yes, I am Marjolaine Pordon. I'm a senior quality consultant at Pregas in the Netherlands, and I'm very excited to be here. I also speak at conferences on the topics of low-code, sustainability, legislation and governance in testing. And in October, I'll be in Bilbao for QA and test on green software testing. So then that's very exciting. Furthermore, I'm on advisory boards for conferences on testing and sustainability. And I'm just back from a biking holiday, which I did all on the bike, a thousand kilometers in 13 <laughs> days. So very low carbon and which we really liked uh, doing. So yeah, that's about me. That's awesome. And you're from the Netherlands, right? So for me, that's probably the most, without sound, sound, sound not rude at all, but uh, it's very stereotypically Dutch to kind of go on a cycling holiday. So that's awesome. Whereabouts did you end up? When did, where did you go? Well, we live in Arnhem, which is in the east, very near Germany. So we rode to Germany in the east and then to the north. And then in uh, the neighborhood of Groningen, we went back down in the Netherlands. So we took two countries, followed some rivers. But it's even for the Dutch, what we did, a thousand kilometers in 13 days, all on bike every day, quite unusual. Okay. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, Andri, can you beat a sustainable cycling holiday by introducing yourself? Wow, that's, that's really <laughs> one to go. And that sounds pretty amazing. I'll definitely have to um, look into doing something like that. But yeah, I am Andri Johnston. I am the Digital Sustainability Lead at Cambridge University Press and Assessment, which is a mouthful. So we just say CUPNA from here on out. And yeah, my, my focus mostly is on digital sustainability in the publishing industry. I've always worked in publishing and I have been working quite hard on trying to both calculate our digital emissions, but also educate the publishing industry wider about digital sustainability because it's something that's very new in the industry because we're very print focused obviously but especially in the academic and education space which is our main focus there's been a huge shift to digital so we want to understand what our digital impact is and how we can improve it i also love gardening and we recently bought a house. So slowly I'm transforming our garden into a little cottage fairy garden for our one-year-old daughter. So that's something that I really enjoy getting me away from the screen as well. So, yeah. Cute. Amazing. That's really great. I feel like 
I am very outnumbered in terms of green and sustainable things that are happening with the guests. But yes, if you recognize my voice, I am Chris, the producer of Environment Variables and now also the producer of CXO Bytes, which is the new podcast that is hosted by Sanjay Poder, the chairperson of the Green Software Foundation that launched last week. So if you have time to check that out, please do. Otherwise, I have not many expertise in uh, the way of software, but I do have expertise in the way of podcasting, which is why I'm filling in for the unstoppable Chris Adams. And uh, so, yeah, we'll be taking you on a journey and I'll be leaning heavily on my guests for their input on the topics today. And I'll be doing my best to keep things afloat on this journey. So just a reminder before we dive into our first topic, that everything that you hear about in this podcast will be linked in the show notes below. We have very detailed show notes and they'll be up on the website, which is podcast.greensoftware.foundation, where you can check out more episodes of Environment Variables. So let's kick us off. Is everybody ready? Yeah, let's yes. go. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So our first news topic today is from the Quartz website, which is an article entitled AI Energy Demand is Ruining Google's Environmental Goals. So this article is about how Google's energy consumption has surged over the past five years, largely due to its AI infrastructure. It's becoming increasingly clear that the energy demands of AI are immense, especially during the inference phase when models make predictions. As Google, like other tech giants, continues to invest in AI, its commitment to hitting net zero emissions by 2030 is put at serious risk. One way Google has pledged to counteract this is by leaning into carbon removal projects, though that approach has generated some controversy in itself. And so one of the things that uh, I read in this article as well that really piqued my attention was the fact that Google is, and well, several influential tech firms, including Amazon Web Services, are turning to nuclear power to fuel their projects. So quite an interesting point there. What are your guys' takes on this article and the sort of the existential threat that AI is having towards sort of its drain on power? Should we start with you, Mario Lane? Well, I, I think that AI is on both sides because we can use it to help us be more sustainable, yet we need a lot of energy to use uh, AI. And I did some research and it's mostly due to the data transmissions that we use so much uh, energy. So I don't think that AI necessarily is causing the problem. It's that we are not ready for the data transmissions that AI needs. So it would be mm. wrong to say AI is the problem. We need AI and we're using it, but we need to look at the data centers and make sure that they are more sustainable and that will help enormously to make AI bigger and better usable, I think. I think that's a really good point because Marilyn kind of alluded to that understanding how it's being used as well, because for us in the publishing education space specifically, it's AI is inevitable in education. It's coming in and we can't ignore it. Students are using it and we have to start using it. It's something we have our own kind of gen AI projects that we've started running pilots. But my main concern when it started was, do we understand what the impact is as well? So, you know, the data centers can become really sustainable, but for us using it to improve our products or our offerings, do we understand what the impact is? So we've actually started we're very much at the start, but we're starting to think about how we can start incorporating carbon emissions of AI into like the KPIs of these pilots, because I think we do need to have a balance between using it and actually understanding what the impact is. So yeah, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I do want to point out though, like you said, Chris, the controversy about the carbon, carbon offsetting, but what do they call it? The, the carbon removal. On the one hand, it's, that's really good because you're removing the carbon, but it doesn't really solve the problem because we'll just keep on adding more and more. Yeah. It's part of the larger problem we face with data centers. We've been given this opportunity to just have everything in the data center, mm. whether it's AI or not. I don't think it really solves the problem for us mm. from a green tech side to just rely on 
data centers doing carbon removal just so they can reach their targets. Yeah. yeah. So I, I definitely want to dive into more of those, those the way you're implementing AI at CUPNA and uh, similar sort of businesses. But I just want to go back to Mario Lane's point about the use of uh, data and the amount of data that we are that AI is using and we're not ready for it. So last time you were on the podcast, Mario Lane, which is I think back in episode 60 something, but last time you, we spoke uh, specifically about the sort of sustainability benefits of low code platforms, which is your special specialty. Do you see a sort of a chance for there to be a, a sort of sustainable software platform such as low code in order to aid this sort of this influx of data that we aren't ready for? Is there some sort of solution that comes from that world that maybe could help with the energy demands of AI? Yeah, it's already there is a lot of platforms are using AI. And I found an article on LinkedIn that said there's a, a synergy between low code and ai because low code brings programming to everyone it's meant to make a programming easier and ai can help with that also to make good mm-hmm. quality because what we see in low code is that the quality of the applications made with low code is under discussion because you still have to follow the rules of programming and a lot of people do not have that education or that experience. Mm. And with AI, that can help. So then we can not only build sustainable apps, but also high quality apps. And AI can also help with the performance. So by using low code, it will be a sustainable app and AI will help to make the quality better. So that's it's definitely something that will grow in the coming years because it's already been used and perfectionated by quite a lot of platforms. Okay, so there's hope yet for software to actually provide a solution to what is being at least outlined in this article. And just going back to your other point, Andri, about the, yeah, using carbon removal to help offset the gains. There's been a big, there's been a lot of talk on this podcast, in fact, about carbon removal credits and how they are, in fact, inefficient in the sort of, and actually solving the problem of carbon emissions by software and in other industries as well, they basically become bargaining tokens for private companies to kind of get away with emitting carbon into the atmosphere. And it's not really, yeah, it's not an ideal solution, but at least it kind of gets companies talking about carbon in more ways, I guess. But yeah, there, there needs to be a different solution that I think is not sort of related to software, unfortunately. So yeah, (laughs) cool. All right. So should we move on to our next topic then? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So our next news article is entitled AWS can help reduce the carbon footprint of AI workloads by up to 99%. So uh, this next article is direct from uh, Amazon itself. And it talks about how there's a recent study that shows how Amazon's AWS data centers could solve the huge energy demands of AI Researchers from Accenture found that migrating from on-site AI infrastructure to AWS data centers could reduce your company's carbon footprint by up to 99%. Now, without trying to sound like this is an advert for AWS, that's obviously quite optimistic. And apparently it's because AWS has advanced efficiency measures, uh, including purpose-built silicon for AI, optimized cooling and renewable energy products, making significantly more sustainable. Um, And I guess the proof of that we will only see in sort of the next few years um, or something like that. Did either of you guys have a take on this? I mean, I found the article really interesting, Mm -hmm. Um, kind of just the, especially around water usage that they were saying, and it's really interesting to see what they are doing to empower, I guess, companies to use more AI. I'll caveat this with, we speak to AWS a lot. We, Mm -hmm. our hosting is with AWS and we do have, it has its challenges, as I'm sure others who work with them know. And we don't always see the results of these innovations come through in the service that we get from them or the how they report on emissions. And I mm-hmm. think that's where we still need some work, I guess, from them before there will be a full trust on kind of just jumping 100% into AI, at least for us, that's one of the things. But I, I do agree. I'm always happy to see when companies are being innovative in, you know, improving their data centers. 
So that is good. Yeah. 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 And just going back to your point about sort of the use of AI at CUP and A. So you talked about a few sort of models that you guys were working with. Is there anything without trying to, you know, obviously give too much proprietary information away? Is there anything that you're excited to talk about? I remember the last time you talked about DIMPACT and how important that was with sort of tracking the way that you guys, well, tracking your carbon emissions through your work. Is there some sort of similar thing that you're employing for your potential use of AI at all? So on AI, we're, like I said, we're using it a lot in our education and English language teaching side of the business. And we have a, a program of Gen AI work with some pilots that we're running. I think what we're trying to do is understand how it can be used in a way to obviously offer our customers as good extra service as possible. What I kind of was pushing for and what I like about working at CUPNA is that there's very much a employee push around sustainability. We had a lot of employees asking the question, how sustainable are these projects? We have this huge goal around being carbon zero. And so there were questions about how we're thinking about it. So as part of our program, we have a like an ethics committee and we are starting with workshops on actually deciding what methodology we're going to use to calculate the emissions from our Gen AI pilots and working with our housing company that we use specifically for our Gen AI projects. Because as I said, the teams working on it are really keen to incorporate kind of carbon emissions into those projects and the pilots' KPIs. Mm. So there is a big push to use it. But at the same time, there's a big ethical drive in the company to also understand it. And because of the work that we've done with Dimpact and making everyone internally very aware of digital carbon emissions, colleagues working on these projects very much feel we need to understand both. So we don't have anything concrete yet, but we have started with, with the workshops to look at what are we going to do. And I think that's always the first step. And it's great when, it, when the people actually working on the projects want to incorporate it. So, yeah. That's, yeah, it's really fascinating. I think the education sector, like you said, students are obviously going to be like the first starting point for wanting to use AI, you know, kind of using ChatGPT to kind of construct an essay. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are many examples of students trying to get away with writing an essay in that same sort of way. Yeah, like besides those sort of the DIMPACT sort of model, the way it's sort of being used to sort of yeah, track your carbon emissions. Is there is there potential for you to actually use it within products that you produce for CUPNA, or is it just purely on on the workload kind of schedule? Uh, in terms of Dimpact, yeah. yeah. So we use Dimpact to calculate the emissions of all of our products that we produce. So okay. all of our yeah. our customer facing products. Mm -hmm. Some work we've also started doing. We're quite we're a big company with multiple products we're trying mm -hmm. to start to kind of bring it down but we have kind of ecosystems of products for academic education english language teaching and exams mm -hmm. and we realized that to really understand a high level footprint we need to start automating so we've taken the dimpact model and what we're starting to do now is to actually simplify it and do automated emissions calculations and this is where AWS comes in a lot because we use our AWS billing information using the cloud carbon footprint uh, methodology and work that we've done with Dimpact to calculate the emissions. We don't rely on the dashboard emissions calculations from or, or reporting from AWS mm -hmm. because when we've questioned some of how it's structured, where the emissions come from, we haven't been able to find, to get answers that we want. Yeah, exact um, results, really. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So similar to the majority of the companies using Dimpact, we actually use location-based emissions factors to mm. work out the emissions for our data centers. So we're automating that part for the whole company. And then we're also in the process of automating our user emissions our end user emissions, which we know isn't technically something we have to report on as part of scope three. But for us, it's important to know what those emissions are. Um, so 
we've kind of shifted gears a little bit um, mm. because of how big the organization is um, and because I've been lucky enough to start focusing on this more um, permanently in this new role. So that's kind of what we're doing. I think when we're going to look at AI emissions, it's going to be trickier because yeah. there's yeah. the hosting, but also the processing power, whatever we're running on individual devices. So the methodology will be slightly different. And I don't know 100% what that's going to look like yet, but we've been looking at methodologies from companies like Bloom because they've, they're quite public with the methodology they've been using. So yes, yeah, trying to see what we can do to automate it, the emissions tra uh, calculation, because yeah, otherwise yeah. it's just a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you touched on sort of scope three emissions there and you also touched on sort of automation as well, which is kind of, I presume Mari Lane, it's one of your expertise with low code software. I guess my question would be for on the low code side is besides obviously cloud hosting is quite important for you guys. But would you be swayed, as like say, for example, if you're developing a low-code app, would you be swayed by the information that you see in the article like this by AWS? Or would you rather have to test the data yourself, you know, and actually sort of figure it out before you go and dive headfirst into choosing AWS over another cloud service provider? Well, I'm quite the skeptical person because mm -hmm. it's an article from AWS. I do think that they're on the right track, definitely, but their numbers are very positive. And then I'm also always a bit cautious. Mm -hmm. I would go talk with them because if they have the right view and the right vision and st uh, strategy, and they might have made their numbers a bit more positive but they're really willing and they're looking to the future, knowing that AI is important and they're going to dive into that. So I'm very positive about that part. And I would definitely talk with AWS because we need these companies. If we look in the Netherlands, data centers are even rejected at the moment because oh. there's simply not enough energy. For the next 10 years, we'll have uh, peak loads on the energy net, but also the water net is very stressed in uh, the Netherlands and probably we're not the only country. Mm -hmm. So to be keeping up with the technology that is needed to keep AI running, uh, and it's inevitable, we need these initiatives. So I would definitely encourage my company to talk with a AWS to check if they are keeping to be innovative so that they don't stop here and say, well, we've done this, so now it's okay. But I really yeah. think that AWS is willing to be the lead in this. In So yeah, I'm very positive about AWS, but a bit skeptical about the numbers. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the overall tone from uh, both of you guys. And yeah, so if you listeners do actually read the article, do take it with a pinch of salt. It is from the is from AWS themselves, so I uh, always got to be a little bit wary anyway. And, you know, from at least from my experience in my interaction with software developers, I feel like everyone likes to test stuff and make sure that it works properly, you know. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure everyone would do that anyway. But yes, please do have a look at those figures because they are quite impressive as well. Cool. OK, so should we move on to the next topic then? Yeah, sure. OK, so. Our next topic is an article entitled Data Center Sustainability Plays for the AI Era. And this is from Data Center Frontier. And they recently chaired a roundtable discussion about the sustainability of the data center industry. And we're obviously sticking with the trend here about data centers. So we've got five industry experts to share their views on building greener, energy efficient data centers that can meet the exponential power demands of AI and GPU based computing. Among the key strategies raised were decarbonizing the energy sources used in data centers, integrating battery storage solutions, innovating in water and waste management, and tracking emission more, emissions more rigorously. So this is something that we've actually just touched on, and in fact, something that's been covered quite a bit on previous episodes of, of the podcast, is actually the demand of data centers, not just on the grid, but also on water as well, which is quite um, a significant sort of pull from the environment. I think one of the latest statistics that we had on the podcast was that every sort of interaction, every sort of minor interaction with a LLM like ChatGPT is sort of two or three glasses of water or something crazy like that. So that's not, don't quote me on that. That's not the exact figure, but we'll find it for the, for the show notes. So Mario Lane, you mentioned sort of the impact on the water, the stress of data, like data pool on the water in a place like the Netherlands. Besides sort of what we've 
talked about previously is that is there any other solutions that you can think of that might sort of play into that yeah, what we are looking in, I think that there's already a pilot in the Netherlands, is that mm -hmm. if the, the water needs to cool down the data center, then the water is hot. So especially in winter, uh, we want to have water lines from the data center to uh, uh, the houses. Mm -hmm. And then they can uh, use that warmed water to wa heat up houses. Then the water is cooled, goes back to the data center. And that way we'll have heating in the houses provided by the data center. Another solution that mm. is figured out is to build the data centers very below water, very deep in the sea, where it's very mm. cold, and then they will be automatically cooled in a way that no fish will be harmed by the heating just around the data center. So that are two solutions that we are looking into while we can have a reuse of the heat or we can uh, cool them down without using our the water that we drink. And I think that's our two solutions that are uh, really worth looking into. Yeah, absolutely. And so two previous examples of this were actually mentioned on the podcast. So one was actually, I'm not too sure which company it was, but there's a company that was testing an underwater day center in the Falkland Islands, which we'll have to uh, find a link for in the show notes below. And then also you're, with the idea of using the heat from data centers to heat houses, there was actually a pilot program in the UK, which was using the heat from data centers to actually heat swimming pools, public swimming pools in certain areas. And there's smaller data centers that, that we're talking about. Obviously the definition of a data center at least from my understanding, from Chris Adams' knowledge, is that it could be, you know, as small as a tiny set of servers in someone's room. So yeah, these are sort of smaller data centers that we're talking about, not the massive sort of AWS sized ones that, that yeah, that need sort of submerging in, in water. But yeah, there's a lot of potential for it. Andre, did you have any thoughts on that at all? Um, I think so. I liked what what in the article some of the the um, experts were talking about kind of the solution of ha like a community kind of solution. I'm a big proponent of having a joined up approach. It's one of the reasons we joined Dimpact as well, because I feel like asking the right questions of data centers and asking them, you know, what are you doing? How are you reporting? I think that's a strategy that needs to, for us, when we started doing our digital carbon calculations, we have a lot of partners we partner with, especially on the academic front, repository systems. We have partners we partner with for soaring code for research. And these are smaller companies who also use data centers like AWS and others. And they don't know the questions to ask. They don't even consider where they're hosted. So for me, there's a, that community approach of talking to data centers, and I also feel like, and this might be controversial, this might be because I work for um, an NGO, but transparency is something that in the sustainability space we need more of. Um, I know it's not something that in the tech industry or companies are very fond of, but I think to allow us to get to a space where we're not going to keep on increasing our energy usage, which is currently just, you know, going up and up as an as a industry we need to become more transparent and we need to have more of a community approach and especially with data centers. So I'd love to see a space where the data centers and the users and the customers actually start to interact more. And it's not just a selling of a service, but it's an education piece, all of that as well. So I think that on top of optimizing, there's that community approach and transparency that can help as well. And it's, I think you're right with making it a solution wider because we also in the Netherlands now are looking into companies working together. Because if I have a company that usually works in at night, make sure that we go all the way to working at night when uh, the energy use is low. So we don't have peak usage and we should do the same with data centers and we should make the companies work together because we have open source software. We are already collaborating. We think that with low code, we should reuse code, but why keep this to ourselves? 
We have one greater goal, and that's keeping this earth livable for futures to come, future generations. And in the pace that we're going now, we're not going hard enough. This summer is crazy. I've had a very hot spring, and now it's a rainy summer, and I'm here with my winter sweater. I know, <laughs> me too. It's terrible. <laughs> and because I refuse to put on the heater in July, but it's extremely cold. I have my wool socks on. It's crazy and it's due to climate change. And we can all say, well, it's not. Sometimes it rains. No, people, this is the time to do a change and we need to work together and that you don't hand over completely your technology. I understand, but let's keep working together, see where we can meet each other and help each other. So I really like your view, Henry. Yeah, I think it also comes like it, it. we need to take it further and maybe, sorry, but going back to that AWS article, it was really interesting that they said they didn't include like embodied emissions because more and more we're getting a kind of conversations or, or views from AWS that they're going to be completely carbon, using completely green energy by the end of 2025. Great. But what about those embodied emissions as well? And I think there's just not even an understanding of how we approach that and who's responsible for it. And again, if we don't have those conversations, then we're not going to know where it's either going to be ignored and then we're going to get to a point where we're like, oh, you know, these emissions have gone up and we're not aware of it. Or we're just going to get stuck in the same process, trying to work it out as individual companies and not find a true solution so transparency i just think it's just so so important and that's why we in the well at least the work that i'm doing in the publishing industry we've been very transparent about the way we've calculated our emissions because we're like ev everyone needs to know how to do it and i'm also very aware i don't come from a tech background so i had to teach myself these things and other industries also use data centers. And these are people who are not tech people. So how are we educating them? How are we talking to them? How are the data centers talking to them? That's something I'm quite passionate about is like actually making digital sustainability and digital carbon emissions as easy to understand as swapping from a plastic bag to a paper bag. Yeah. Sorry, went off on a little bit of a tangent. No, no, it's, go. Just, it's great. I think we need that more. We need more of that. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. And I totally agree with that. And the transparency message is super in line with what the Green Software Foundation is trying to do with everything. You know, if you actually go onto the GitHub page of the GSF, you can see all the projects in every sort of stage that they're being developed in. So it's something that the GSF is trying to push, you know, other companies to do. And it's so amazing to see that they are already people that are working in industries that aren't necessarily software related, where they are actually already doing these things, you know, and like you said, Marilyn, it's like the, you know, the, just because they don't want to share certain bits of technology, you know, it's like that, that is mind blowing considering the, you know, existential threats that, that are be, being faced by, you know, everyday humans. And also like the transparency thing, like you said, for me, a complete layman when it comes to, you know, at least data centers, I would say, I probably just because of this podcast, my knowledge has increased 10 times than the, than the average person. But, you know, having that as a customer, being able to understand, okay, if I choose AWS, or if I choose another cloud service provider, you know, what is my impact on the environment by doing that by clicking that button that says, buy now, you know, so yeah, it's something that I would love to see, you know, it, and like you said, like, yeah, just as it, making it as easy as being able to, you know, choose a plastic bag or a paper bag is the next step. And I think it's, it starts with people like you guys and it starts with the GSF, I think. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay. So should we move on to our last, our final news topic before we round up the episode? Yep. Okay. So our last news topic is uh, AI is starving for more power. Can quantum computing help? So we'll end off things by looking at another promising solution to the AI power problem. A uh, recent Computer World article that looked at the potential of quantum computing to cut AI energy consumption. 
Uh, while still in early development, this is a transformative technology that could revolutionize the landscape, making AI operations more sustainable. With its superior processing capabilities, quantum computing could help handle the complex tasks and large data sets that AI requires far better than standard computing. So I'm going to ask one of you to probably Marjolaine, I think, could you provide us with a definition of quantum computing for the uh, those people who don't know what it what it means? Well, I I needed to dive in a bit my myself because it is quite an interesting topic. But it's well, it's like you have if I make the uh, for example the difference with the low code and Lego, there are mm -hmm. some similarities. You have Duplo, and mm -hmm. anyone can build with Duplo. But you have also Lego Mindstorms. Well, in quantum computing is the Lego Mindstorms. It's okay. quite complex. <laughs> it's what you see in sci-fi movies. I see some pictures. It's like we go back to big computers. But it's brilliant because besides processing zeros and ones, they mm -hmm. can process more bytes in combined. So they're yeah. not using every single byte. They can put bytes together and process them. Which means yeah. that a standard computer uh, needs decades to uh, process certain amount of algorithms, which a quantum computer can do in seconds. There's just a big risk. Yeah. There's one very big negative point about it, and that's security. Because we can imagine if it takes decades to find a password of someone, a quantum computer can do it in seconds. And if that technology will evolve, mm. it will be very interesting for hackers to use. Yeah, it's kind of scary, I guess. I found the article really interesting because I didn't know much about quantum computing. But um, so I found it really, really interesting. And uh, just from an academic point of view, I think it can save a lot of energy to do some research that needs to be done. But is there enough research about the comparative energy usage I guess my point is I think this is the kind of technology that should be used for the AI where we want to solve problems but you know how far does it go but I think it's fascinating and I think it's really good that there's a better solution it's just really hard to understand still yet I guess yeah I had, I had also two questions due to the article the one was okay, I can do something in seconds, but how many energy does that take up in comparison to something that takes decades? I would say less, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Another point is, where do you use it for? And if that is to, instead of needing decades, I can find medicine or I can do research to help people be more healthy and it only takes seconds instead of decades, then I'm all for it. But if it is to increase the speed in which I can write my essay, then I say, well, let's just use the standard computer because... Yeah. So I agree with Henry. We should, with this technology, be really aware where do we use it because it's also with the security part, but also where do we need to use it? And in medicine, I say this would be a huge advantage, but I don't think it's necessary to use it everywhere. I remember a couple of... It was like a year or two ago, I read an article and spoke to a researcher here at the University of Cambridge who was looking at the energy usage of running, you know, data sets um, for research. And the, he was basically saying that, uh, you know, trying to find mo the most energy efficient way. And I can 100% see that, um, you know, this could be used for that kind of thing. But those kinds of research that's that's is usually done by a university which has some kind of carbon strategy already or maybe a company that has a carbon strategy so i think there should be like an ethical kind of layer to it as well around when it's used and how it's used and on the security side i think if it's a risk to security then we should also see if there's a way for it to make our systems more secure because otherwise you know, that's a big problem for companies right now. So, yeah. It's just like, like we said, like there's not enough sort of real world applications that it's been used in yet. So that's one of the things the article actually points out is that there's no real sort of 
useful application for it yet. You know, there's been small scale experimentation and debugging, but besides that, you know, integrating it with AI would be a logical step. And I agree with uh, Mario Lane's point, yeah, about using it for medical research, you know, and all ways that we can reduce our impact on the environment. Those are the, the, definitely the two things that I think would probably be at the forefront of people who are using quantum computing, I imagine. Cool. Okay. So just before we end today's episode, as we are running up on time, we just have to give you two two bits of uh, information about events that are happening soon. And one of them is actually today, which is the day that the episode goes up, which is the 18th of July. And this is an event called Web Green Skills by Met Talent AI. And this is happening at 5.30 p.m. Central European time. And this is it's an online event that's being run by Met Talent AI's Thought Leadership team on shaping a sustainable AI future. The second event is an event that's happening on July 23rd in Karlsruhe, Germany. And that's an event called Climate Conscious Websites for a More Sustainable Net. So links to both of those events are down in the show notes below. Okay, so we've come to the end of our episode. And before we head off, I have one final question for both of our guests which is where can listeners go if they want to find out more about you? Marjolaine, how about we start with you, please? Now you can find me on uh, LinkedIn, Marjolaine Pordon, and my name is written also in the show notes so you can uh, see how it's written. And also on uh, Instagram or uh, my website, ladylowcode.com, and my Instagram is also ladylowcode. Awesome. And Andri? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Andre Johnston. I'm the only Andre Johnston on there. So yeah, you can find me on there. My Instagram is more focused on sustainable motherhood. So if you would like to look into that, it's called the Sustainable Library. But yeah, LinkedIn is where I do all my digital sustainability stuff. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Marilene and Andre. A final reminder to our listeners that all our resources for this episode are in the show description notes below. And you can visit podcast.greensoftware.foundation to listen to more episodes of Environment Variables. And we'll see you all in the next episode. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder to follow Environment Variables on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please do leave a rating and review if you like what we're doing. It helps other people discover the show. And of course, we'd love to have more listeners. To find out more about the Green Software Foundation, please visit greensoftware.foundation. That's greensoftware.foundation in any browser. Thanks again and see you in the next episode.